after forging a peace between the human and gargoyle societies of Britannia, you've once more spent time back home on Earth. But one day, you feel Britannia beckoning you to return. You grab the Orb of the Moons and rush to the Circle of Stones, where inexplicably, a Moon Gate is already waiting for you. So begins Ultima 7 The Black Gate, released two years after Ultima 6, and you're thrust into a pitch black main menu with ominous music playing in the background. What kinds of troubles will you face in Britannia this time? To find out, you need to create a character, which is now the only choice as the character import function does not exist in this game, which admittedly is understandable especially since the character class system for the player character had been becoming less and less important, as the avatar had been its own class since Ultima 5 and the character creation had more of an effect on your starting attributes than anything else. Following that logic of let's cut the fat from this process, the character creation consists of choosing a name and the sex of the character, after which you're immediately thrust into the world of Britannia. The way in which the shorter introduction segment was made, in comparison to the one in Ultima 6, also addresses one of my criticisms of the cutscenes in that game, as this time the only thing you see of your character is a quick animation of a hand pounding a monitor, there's more of a feeling of immersion that isn't broken by showing your character looking like something completely different from what you chose in the character creation. Granted, it's not all positives, as the minuscule options also mean that you no longer choose from multiple portraits, and as such, the only meaningful aesthetic choice you can make is to choose between the two available sexes. In Britannia, you arrive to interrupt a conversation between Iolo and a local peasant. This scene immediately shows you a few additions and changes to the game engine. The major change that is immediately evident is how the user interface has received a complete overhaul. Since Ultima 3 all the way until Ultima 6, the user interface followed a very specific design with some minor alterations. The game window was on the left, taking the majority of the screen space, and on the right were the party and text parser windows. This time, the party and text parser portions are gone, and the game world display takes the entirety of the screen. This has also necessitated the redesign of many other features, such as how conversations work. The first part of the conversation before your arrival is shown via floating text above the character saying the lines of dialogue. This allows the engine to show conversations that you're not a part of in a way that doesn't interrupt the flow of the game allowing for situations such as Eve's dropping on conversations or just having fluff text for characters, which can be used to add more depth to the game world. The second part of the conversation shows how it works when you are a part of the conversation. In this mode, the dialogue is split between the top and the bottom segments of the screen, with a portrait of the character before the text denoting who is saying the lines or doing the actions described in the text. Another thing that has now changed and thus changes some parts of the game flow is how the removal of the text parser means that the player can no longer skip segments in the same way they could in earlier games, and most quests must be done in a specific order so you can unlock the necessary keywords to proceed with the quest. Having reacquainted with Iolo, the mayor of the town also arrives to present to you the first quest of the game, to investigate a tragedy that has happened in the nearby stables. This scene immediately sets the mood which you can expect going forwards. While the other games in the Ultima series have tackled delicate and uncomfortable subjects at times, this time the new engine and improved visuals allow for the game to show you the horrors of the world in more detail. This to me was the first real indicator that the world of Britannia would be far more brutal than before. Sure, in Ultima 5, Lord Blackthorn could chop your companions in half, and there were people chained to walls and held in stockades, but in general, the world felt like a somewhat standard fantasy world where people were going about their business without too much worry about the state of the world. But now, that is clearly not the case anymore, and the evils of the world are going to impact the lives of the everyday inhabitants of the world more than ever before. 
Investigating the ritualistic murder acts as a kind of tutorial that is meant to get the player used to the completely new user interface. In Ultima 6, a mouse was a viable secondary means of controlling the game, but the entire interface was built on top of the already existing functionalities of the previous games. Thus, playing Ultima 6 on the keyboard alone was likely more comfortable for many Ultima veterans, as the game worked practically the same way as Ultima 5 did when played on a keyboard. Ultima 7, on the other hand, has a completely new style of controlling the game, made with the intention that the entire game could be and would be played with the mouse alone. This extends to the game actually having a pause menu, which includes some basic options and a save load menu that has also been significantly improved, giving the player multiple save slots for the first time in the series. The equipment and inventory systems have also received an overhaul. Each character has their own status window with a full body character portrait. Around this portrait are the slots for equipable items. One interesting feature here is how you need to also equip containers in which to carry other items, meaning that there is no magical inventory that exists out of time and space, but most characters come equipped with a backpack that can be removed or replaced. As an extension of this system, the inventory windows as well are representative of the container you're viewing. For example, opening a backpack opens a new window that looks like an opened backpack, and items can be placed freely within that window. You move your characters by holding the right mouse button or double right-clicking on a space to make your characters move to that location. Left-click is used to investigate and activate things, and objects in the world can be dragged and dropped to either just move them or pick them up into someone's inventory. Due to the new parcelless keyword system, new conversation topics can be learned from these actions as well, in addition to learning them from other characters. Almost everything in the game world that you think is in some way interactable or movable is that, and the ability to drag and drop objects makes rearranging items either in the game world or in containers an integral part of the game. Many of the interactable parts of the world do not serve much purpose other than making the world seem more real and giving the NPCs in the game jobs to do. For example, you can use a bucket to draw water from a well, which can be used to fill throws, or just dumped into the ground. Mostly pointless, yes, but still a fascinating feature to have in a game. Even though the gameplay window size has been increased compared to the previous game, so have the sprite sizes of everything in the game. This allows for an incredibly detailed world, but it does also have a negative side to it. All of the previous games have been turn-based, where player actions, or just waiting long enough to pass a turn, moved a time forwards. This time, though, the world moves in real time, independent of the player actions. Despite this, the gameplay has not been completely adjusted to this change, and player movement is still grid-based and instant. This, to me at least, made movement feel somewhat confusing sometimes, especially when moving at faster speeds, as the world just snaps into place at each step you take, instead of scrolling smoothly. Every game before has worked this way, and it wasn't as much of an issue, but the new closer camera angle and how the rest of the world is constantly moving makes this feature somewhat disorienting to me, and trying to navigate around doors or to narrow staircases felt like a little bit more difficult thing than it could have been. Food is also an important resource once more. In Ultima 6, the usefulness of food was diminished immensely, as you only really needed it if you were camping. But since the Orb of the Moons made camping rather pointless, food was something that didn't really need much consideration. Now though, the characters in your party get hungry as time passes, and being extremely hungry is detrimental to the health of the characters, requiring you to feed your party periodically. Not only will your party perform better when fed, but you will not have to look at the constant I'm hungry, I could eat something dialogue pop-ups on your screen if you do so. Unfortunately, the characters do not know how to automatically feed themselves, so it has to be done manually, and honestly becomes a little bit tedious the longer you play the game. Food is also an example of the interactivity and logic of the world, as you can not only buy food, but you can go hunting wild animals or someone's livestock if you're so inclined for meat. Or you can use the water you can draw from the well to mix it with flour and bake yourself some bread. 
Continuing the investigation by talking to the inhabitants of the city, you find out that the two most likely suspects in the case are a man with a hook for a hand and a wingless gargoyle companion. Since the town has been in lockdown and the only ones who've left the city were on board of the ship called the Crown Jewel, it is your only clue on where to continue your investigations. You find out more about the potential motivation for the murder from the son of the murdered blacksmith, who also decides to join you in your travels. Before the murder, his father had had an argument with some of the members of the group called The Fellowship, a new religion that has been formed since your last visit in Britannia over 200 years ago. Talking to the chapter leader of Trinzic, you find out more about their philosophy. The Fellowship follows a triad of inner strength, strive for unity, or how we should all work together in harmony towards a common goal. Trust thy brother, or how you should have trust in your fellow man, and not treat them with hatred and fear. Worthiness precedes reward, or how you should strive to be worthy of the good things you wish to attain in life. Using these three principles, the Fellowship has created a new way of life different from the path of principles and virtues already familiar to the Avatar. Instead of being strictly a personal philosophy of self-improvement, the Fellowship concentrates on the potential of the collective over the individual, teaching the people of Britannia how unity and support for others is more important than concentrating solely on improving yourself. This philosophy is not the only thing that the Fellowship is intending to change in Britannia, but they are actively striving to leave behind the old-fashioned world you know of. This is shown not only in the dialogue of some of the Fellowship members, but in how the manual that came with the game is written. From the very beginning, the Ultima series manuals have been written in an in-universe fashion, often as a compendium written by a historian or something similar. Ultima 7 is no exception, and the manual of the game has been written from the perspective of Batlin, the lead run founder of the Fellowship. Thus, reading the manual thoroughly gives you a better perspective on the philosophy and point of view which you can expect. For example, in the part describing the history of Britannia, the deeds of the Avatar are not described with unwavering praise, but instead the negative aspects of what your deeds wrought are also mentioned and rightfully criticized, while also admitting that perhaps for the time this was the best approach. But there is also an underlying thought of why should we rely on the Avatar, who comes and goes as he pleases, when we could unify together and face adversity as a collective instead of relying on a hero to do it for us. Thus, the cause of the Fellowship is to bring the people of Britannia to a new age of enlightenment and shed the past reliance on a few powerful individuals and old traditions. So much so that even the writing system based on the runic alphabet is seen as a relic that should be replaced. This too is shown in the game world where many signs are written in plain English, but many other things still use the runic alphabet, showing a contrast of the old and the new, and the changes the world is currently going through. Concluding your investigation intrinsic, having a lead to follow, and answering a copy protection questionnaire, you're free to explore the rest of the world, which is once more an open world where you can travel seamlessly from one place to another. Even dungeons and caverns are now a part of the world and can just be walked into instead of entering a square which loads you into another map. This kind of an open world also means that there's a new height axis in play, and multi-story buildings and such are also directly in the game world, and you can use existing stairways or, once you create yourself by stacking in-game objects, to climb over obstacles or reach otherwise unreachable areas. This time you're also given an in-game map you can use to find your bearings in the game world. Granted, for those unfamiliar with the world, this unlabeled map is not initially of much use, but acquiring a sextant unlocks a feature that shows your position on the in-game map, which makes exploring the world so much easier. The gameplay loop from this point onwards is very similar to the formula created in the previous trilogy of games, where most of the journey is about travelling across the world, learning about the current state of Britannia, and eventually figuring out what to do to reach the end. This time, the thread that guides you through this journey is the gruesome murder, as you gather more information about the murderers and their motives. First place the investigation takes you is the capital city of Britain, this time a bustling metropolis full of stores and other services. 
In Britain, you can visit the museum, where numerous items from your previous journeys and from the history of Britannia are on display, such as the runes of the virtues and the lenses used to view the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom. There are carnival games, pubs and even a theatre that is preparing for a play based on your exploits, with the most accurate dialogue for the Avatar character that you could ever think of. Unfortunately though, the investigation reaches a dead end as the ship carrying the suspects never reached Britain. Therefore, it is time to visit the main attraction, which is once more the castle of Lord British, where you can gain more information about the current predicament faced by Britannia. Many things have changed as since your last visit, most notably the appearance of the Fellowship whom Lord British holds in quite high regard. Despite them representing a new wave of thought and philosophy, it is only natural that the people would change as the world does, and you hear they're doing much good for the community. On the more negative side of things, magical forces in Britannia seem to be breaking down. Not only is magic more difficult to do, as even Lord British has to strain himself to perform magical feats. Many of the older mages have begun to lose their senses. The court mage Nistel is a sad example of this, barely capable of understanding where he even is anymore. A far cry from the wise, prescient mage whose abilities once saved you from a gargoyle sacrifice. Despite this, Lord British is still capable of healing your party and resurrecting party members, making his castle a good base of operations once more. The Moon Gates as well are no longer as predictable as they were, but are unstable and dangerous to use. It is as if magic is slowly disappearing from the world. The only clue Lord British has for why this might be happening is to guide you towards another old acquaintance, the mage Rudion, who was experimenting with a material called Blackrock and believed that this material was somehow connected with what was happening to the magical forces in Britannia. Lord British also gives you two forms of transportation, his Orb of the Moons and a deed to a ship. The orb works similarly to the previous game but is far more limited. Instead of having options to gate travel to the shrines and the moon gates of each major settlement, now the only options are the town moon gates, which are represented by the same directions as in Ultima 6. There is another drawback as well, as the moon gates aren't working as reliably as before. This applies also to the gates opened by the orb, resulting in a possibility that a gate repels you, potentially dealing damage in the process. The ship works basically the same as before as well. There is no need to consider the wind, but a specific deed is required to commandeer a specific vessel. Therefore, the deed given by Lord British can only be used to sail his personal ship, and if you lose the deed, you also lose access to the ship. A new feature with the ships is a cargo hold that can be used as a portable storage, which is a very useful thing to have, as inventory management takes a very important role. The backpacks your characters have, for example, can only fit so much stuff. Not only because of the carry weight limit, but because they also have a new hidden value that determines how much space the containers have. You might want to grab several bags and use them to organize your inventory, but it is not possible, as several bags just do not fit inside a backpack. This also makes another thing somewhat difficult. Organizing your keys. In Ultima 6, all keys were marked with a letter or a number, making organizing them somewhat easy. This time, the differences in keys are visual, sometimes extremely minuscule, and sometimes non-existent. And as you don't have a key ring, if you don't keep track of which key is which, you can end up trying each key to a lock before finding the correct one. Another thing that makes this more of a chore is how the contents of your backpacks shuffle on their own, so organizing items in specific spots doesn't work either. Therefore, organizing items in external containers like the ship's cargo hold is an extremely useful way for keeping track of items you may need later and don't want to accidentally misplace during your travels. Personally, I kind of disliked sailing. Because of the field of view being so narrow and the ship taking so much space on the screen, I never felt comfortable sailing, especially as even the ship just snaps into place and I never got comfortable with how the turning of the ship worked, so instead I preferred another means of transportation, such as the magic carpet. 
A hidden transportation method which is arguably the best way to travel the world. Yes, it shares the same issues I have with a ship, but since you can fly straight to where you want to instead of having to navigate the contours of the continent, it was not so much of an issue to me. Talking through the other people in the city begins to throw some suspicion over the fellowship. The stories of the merchants and beggars seem to point towards the fellowship using shady tactics to gain funds and resources, which are then distributed to members of high status. With these suspicions in mind, you can join the fellowship to see if you could find more about the organization. This can be done by talking to the fellowship leader Batlin, who subjects you to a questionnaire, deeming you a troubled person in need of the organization, and gives you a test of loyalty delivering a sealed box to Minoc. This is where the game truly opens up. Yes, you've been able to go anywhere since leaving Trinzik, but haven't really had any reason to. Now there are multiple lines of investigation to go for, and a few directions the game points you at. Where did the murder suspects go? What's the deal with the Fellowship? What is happening to magic? It is a brilliant way to get the player to experience the world while having direction, but also retaining the player's ability to just explore freely. During your travels, you will also do a lot of fighting, and to be honest, this in my opinion is one of the worst changes in the game. Since everything works in real time now, so does the combat. With the jerky movements and characters being able to bundle together, fighting tends to be chaotic and quite confusing, and it feels like you have very little to do with the process of fighting itself, and most of your influence on the fights has to do with how you've equipped your characters. The exception to this is magic and potions, which can be used during combat. And that is easier than actually fighting, as opening the inventory to reach your spellbook pauses the game, allowing you to easily select the spell you wish to use. This time though, the avatar is the only one capable of using magic during combat, as the magical capabilities of Britannian natives have been severely diminished. Pausing the game also allows you to use the potions, whether on yourself or on other characters. This does allow for one of the cheesiest ways to win battles by having an abundance of sleeping potions and using those on dangerous enemies that would otherwise be difficult to deal with. The magic system itself is very similar to that of Ultima 6. Once you receive a spellbook, it comes with some basic spells, but to open up more spells you have to purchase them or receive them by other means. The spellbook also shows you the amount of times you can cast each spell, which is dependent on how many of the required reagents you have in your inventory. Another negative thing about the combat is that there are no good visual indicators of the health of your party members. In the previous games, it was a simple thing to check the status of your party, as they were constantly listed on the top right of the screen. But this time, to check the status of your party members, you have to check them individually from their character status window. Dying is once more not the end of the game, but instead on death your party is resurrected by fellowship mages, and you end up at their homeless shelter near Paws, being mostly a minor inconvenience. Leveling up happens automatically, giving your characters training points. This is the new system for character attribute improvement, and there are several trainers spread around the world. Each of them has a different training routine that improves different character attributes, of which there are now five, and costs a different amount of training points. Following up on the clues takes the player on a long journey around the world, encountering more murders, and by investigating them, finding out more about the events plaguing Britannia and the parties involved. The story in Ultima 7 is definitely one of the best in the series, and despite my dislike of the combat system, I hold this game in very high regard for the story and how fleshed out and interactive the world is. What starts as a seemingly simple murder mystery evolves into a story about events on an apocalyptic scale. As you follow each of the clues, you also encounter new murder scenes with new clues that begin to point towards a specific direction. Even though you're always one step behind the murderers, the clues start to amass and you learn more about everything else going on in the world as well. Eventually, it is revealed that the Fellowship is not at all a benevolent organization, but is in fact behind the ritualistic murders, done as a way to stop those who defect from the organization or are in other ways in opposition to them, from revealing the deepest and darkest secrets of the Fellowship.
One of which is that the Fellowship is trying to summon a godlike being from the void, called the Guardian, into Britannia. If they would be successful, this being would have the ability to take over the world and subjugate everyone under his rule. Even the disturbances in magic and the moon gates are the doing of this entity by the means of three hidden devices called the generators that disturb the magical ether. After all, if the people of the world are deprived of magic and easy transportation, they are far easier to control. This is where the game could have been even more brilliant than it already is, as I've been a little bit dishonest so far. In reality, there is no mystery about whether the Fellowship is evil or not, since the game practically spoils that revelation before you even get into the game by having the Guardian taunt you as you launch the game. For I shall be your companion, your provider, and your master. <laughs> From the very beginning, you're also given ample references to the Guardian and his choice of words, linking all of these together before you even reach Britain. In my opinion, this could have been so much better had the mystery of whether the Fellowship was evil or not actually been a mystery. And you could have had the chance to ponder whether you're just resistant to change and if this new philosophy is doing good just in a way that's unfamiliar to you, or if they are indeed connected with the ritualistic murders. In a way, I think this might have been the idea at some point during development, as at one point in the game, Batlin sends you on one more test into the dungeon Distard. Knowing that this dungeon used to be the home of the dragons, there's obviously some apprehension. But Batlin tries to convince you that it's all fine, the dragons have left long ago. Of course, this is not the case, and the dungeon is full of dragons and is more dangerous than ever. This to me feels like the perfect spot where it could have been finally confirmed that the Fellowship is up to no good, and the occurrence of two Fellowship members in the town where the murders happened wasn't just a coincidence. Despite this, I still love the game and the story, I just believe it could have been even better with some changes. Some parts that make this world so brilliant is how during your travels, you get to meet many familiar faces and plenty of new ones who have their own lives and stories, making this game feel even more fleshed out than any of the previous Ultimas. So much of the game has to do with the personal problems of the people who live in Britannia, even if in the end it all leads to the larger underlying plot that concerns the fate of the world. For example, you can meet a prisoner in Lord British's castle who talks about how poverty and class division have become large problems as the growth of Britain drained the commerce from his home of paws and how he is now being unjustly prisoned. In Scarabray, the forgetful mage who acted as a merchant in Ultima 6 finally went full megalomaniac and became a lich, resulting in a sequence of events that destroyed the entire town and trapped the spirits of the inhabitants to be his eternal slaves. Each town has its own story, and the people in them are much more fleshed out than before, whether it's how logging is causing the extinction of another sentient race, or how the gargoyles are still experiencing prejudice and discrimination, with some of the humans even having an organization specifically meant to drive away the gargoyles. There are so many little stories to encounter as you follow the trail of the quest breadcrumbs. This is an amazing feature, and the game brilliantly leads you to experience as much of it as possible by having the quests of the game chained together into what could also be seen as one really, really, really long quest with several smaller steps. Eventually, with the help of the Time Lord, you're able to destroy the Guardian's devices, which unfortunately disrupts the magical ether so much that the Moon Gates stop working completely. These devices and the other evil forces of the Fellowship also contain an easter egg of sorts, which uh, some gamers even today may find appealing. Finally, you travel to the hidden fortress of the Fellowship, where you catch up with the murderers you've been chasing since the very beginning, finally bringing justice of the sword upon them, and destroying the Black Gate, which the Fellowship intended to use to bring the Guardian into Britannia. No, you cannot do that! You must not! Damn you, Avatar! Damn you! Once more, 
you've saved the realm from peril. But, unlike the previous times, you are unable to go home, as the moon gates no longer function. Despite this, you can rest assured that for now Britannia is safe, and after all, sacrifice is a virtue. Unfortunately, Batlin was able to escape, but without the aid of his deity and organization, he must surely no longer be a threat to be reckoned with. Ultima 7 is a fantastic game, even if I have some issues with the mechanics of the game. Yes, I would prefer the combat to be more into my taste, and I would like to feel like I'm contributing to the fights in some meaningful way, but at the very least, most of the fights are generally not that difficult, and I was able to concentrate on the absolutely fantastic parts of the game, namely the story and the world. Not only is the world of Britannia much more detailed than ever before, and the amount of interactable objects is even by today's standards incredible. Almost everything can be moved and the world has been made to feel lived in. There are even quests that continue the style started in Ultima 6 with the hot air balloon quest, where an item you've likely walked past before, looked at it and deemed it unimportant, still play a large part in the story. Of course, this interactivity and freedom do come with their drawbacks, and it is very much possible to softlock yourself by not managing your inventory properly. Because of this possibility of seemingly unimportant items having a purpose, if you happen to grab something important and then drop it somewhere, it can be extremely difficult to find that item again. The story, even though I believe it could have been better, ranks as one of the best in the series. Compared to the previous games, the mood of the story is far more dire. The closest it really got was in Ultima 5, but even then it didn't feel like it was quite as dire, because you weren't able to properly see the poor situations the inhabitants of the world were in. Sure, there were some instances, but far less than in Ultima 7, which is understandable considering all the technical improvements since then. Now, the individual stories of the people of Britannia are far more fleshed out, partially due to the environmental storytelling, and partially due to there just being so much more space for their dialogue, and there being many, many more characters to interact with. Even the amount of books you can read is quite massive, even if most of them just give a synopsis of what the book is about, but what books a person has in their possession acts as another way for the game to tell you more about them. And it's these stories that made me feel like the main story held even more importance than it would have had it been separate from these individual stories. Is it a huge story just saving a world from a superpowered deity trying to take over the world? Of course, but it hits much more when you get to actually know those you're trying to save and get to help them with their problems while you're doing so. After all, many of the issues you end up helping people with would have been problems, even without the Guardian's influence. It's just fantastic. The audiovisual presentation is again miles above the previous game. Ultima 7 is absolutely gorgeous and sounds beautiful, especially when using Munt, a Roland synthesizer emulator. The GOG version of the game also comes with the expansion pack, The Forge of Virtue, which is a really nice throwback to the first Ultima trilogy and deals with the resurgence of the island where you defeated Exodus. Not only does the expansion give a bit more insight into Exodus and uh, many other things in the past, such as confirming that the Balrons you have fought in previous games were in fact gargoyles, it also allows you to make your avatar far stronger than you could in the base game and relatively early on as well, which I admit is part of the reason why I felt the combat was on the easier side. Being a super powerful character with a demon powered sword that can kill things in one blow was fun, even if you could sometimes be not very avatar like with it. Finally, I have to give massive credit to the Ultima fanbase, since everything I've mentioned as a negative thing has been in relation to the vanilla game available on GOG. But many of those issues can be resolved by downloading Exult, a project aiming to recreate Ultima 7 for modern operating systems. 
That is a fantastic project which takes a great game and not only makes it work well on modern computers without much hassle, but also adds some very good improvements, such as the ability to have character health information on the screen during combat, a quick button to try all of the keys you have in your inventory on a door without having to do it manually, or even play the game on a higher resolution, showing you more of the world on screen at once, which makes sailing far less annoying. Granted, due to how the maps were constructed, this can show you things you were never supposed to see, as the game was built for a smaller resolution. Of course, Exalt is not perfect either, but for a first-time Ultima 7 player, they might find that version a little bit more comfortable to play with. In conclusion, Ultima 7 is one of my favorite Ultima games, and deservedly so. It's also where I'd suggest people start trying the series for themselves, if starting from Ultima 4 feels like going too far back in time. Anyway, that is it for this time. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope to see you next time. But until then, Fintrovert, signing out.